Today, we speak about the first woman to become a pioneering fossil collector and paleontologist in 19th century England, and who made significant discoveries along the Jurassic coast. She sought recognition for her scientific contributions, often denied to her because of her gender and social class. This is the remarkable story of Mary Anning. Hello and welcome. If you would like to see more from Untold History Women, then just click on that subscribe button. Now, let's start today's video. Viewer discretion is advised. This is an educational documentary. Mary Anning was born on May 21st, 1799, in Lyme Regis, Dorset, England. Her father, Richard Anning, was a cabinet maker and carpenter who also collected and sold fossils. Her mother was Mary Moore, known as Molly. The Annings lived near the sea, and their home was sometimes flooded by storms. The family attended a local chapel, initially as independents, later known as Congregationalists. Molly and Richard Anning had ten children. Their first Mary was born in 1794, but died at four years old after her clothes caught fire. This tragic incident was reported in the Bath Chronicle on December 27, 1798. When Mary Anning was born five months after her deceased sister, she was named Mary in her honour. More children followed, but only Mary and her brother Joseph, three years older, survived to adulthood. This high child mortality rate was typical in 19th century UK, where almost half the children died before age five, especially in crowded areas like Lyme Regis due to diseases like measles and smallpox. On August 19th, 1800, when Mary Anning was 15 months old, she was being held by a neighbour, Elizabeth Haskings, under an elm tree during an equestrian show. Lightning struck the tree, killing Haskings and two other women. Onlookers rushed Mary home and revived her with a bath of hot water. A local doctor called her survival miraculous. Her family noted that she had been a sickly baby, but after the incident, she thrived. People in her community later attributed her curiosity, intelligence and lively personality to this event. By the late 18th century, Mary's hometown had become a popular seaside resort, especially after 1792, when travel to Europe became dangerous due to the French Revolutionary Wars. Wealthy and middle-class tourists flocked to the area. Locals supplemented their income by selling fossils, known as curios, to visitors. These fossils had colourful names like snake stones, devil's fingers and vertebraries, often believed to have medicinal and mystical properties. Fossil collecting was trendy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, evolving from a hobby to a science as their importance to geology and biology was recognised. The primary source of these fossils was the coastal cliffs around Lyme Regis, part of the Blue Lias Formation. This geological structure, rich in fossils, consists of layers of limestone and shale from the early Jurassic period, about 210 to 195 million years ago. Their father, Richard, often took Mary and her brother on fossil hunting trips to help support the family. They sold their finds to tourists outside their home. During this time, England's poor-faced hardship due to the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, which caused food shortages, Wheat prices nearly tripled between 1792 and 1812, but working-class wages stayed the same. In Dorset, the high cost of bread led to unrest and riots. Richard Anning even helped organise a protest against the food shortages. The family's status as religious dissenters, not followers of the Church of England, led to discrimination. In the early 1800s, those who did not subscribe to the Church of England's articles couldn't study at Oxford or Cambridge, join certain army positions, or enter several professions. Mary's father, already suffering from tuberculosis and a cliff fall injury, died in November 1810, aged 44. He left the family in debt and without savings, forcing them to seek poor relief, whilst they kept collecting and selling fossils, setting up a curiosities table near a local inn's coach stop. 
In 1814, Everard Holmes' paper featured a side view of a long, thin skull with needle-like teeth and a large eye socket belonging to Temnodontosaurus placudon, previously known as Ichthyosaurus placudon, discovered by Mary's father in 1811. That same year, Mary now aged 12, and her brother found a four-foot ichthyosaur skull, with Mary later uncovering the complete skeleton. The Anning family received £23 for the fossil from William Bullock, sparking public interest when displayed in London. Eventually, in May 1819, the fossil was auctioned for £45 and five shillings to the British Museum, who coined the name Ichthyosaurus for it. Mary's mother initially managed the family's fossil business after her husband Richard's death, while Joseph remained involved until at least 1825, and Mary gradually took over the leading role by mid-1820. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Birch, a wealthy collector from Lincolnshire, emerged as the Anning family's most dedicated customer. In 1820, Birch grew concerned about the family's financial struggle. With no significant discoveries for a year, they faced the prospect of selling their furniture to cover rent. To alleviate their hardship, Birch organised an auction for the fossils he had acquired from them. The auction, held at Bullocks in London on May 15, 1820, raised £400, which is equivalent to £40,000 today. While the exact amount given to the Annings remains unknown, the auction stabilised their finances and heightened their standing in the geological community. The event attracted buyers from Paris and Vienna, further elevating the family's profile. Mary Anning sustained herself by selling fossils, primarily invertebrate ones like ammonite and belemnite shells, which were abundant in the area and fetched a modest price. Vertebrate fossils, especially ichthyosaur skeletons, commanded higher prices but were much scarcer. Yet collecting them was perilous, particularly during the winter months. An article in the Bristol Mirror in 1823 described her as a determined individual who tirelessly scoured the cliffs of Lyme Daly, risking her life under the overhanging cliffs. These cliffs were her prime hunting ground as they harboured the valuable remnants of a bygone era. She braved the danger of falling rocks and the relentless tide to snatch these relics before they vanished forever. Her relentless efforts were credited with supplying most of the exceptional specimens of ichthyosauri found in major collections. Mary wrote to a friend in November of that year, Perhaps you will laugh when I say that the death of my old faithful dog has quite upset me. The cliff that fell upon him and killed him in a moment before my eyes and close to my feet. It was but a moment between me and the same fate. Mary's fame grew as she made more important discoveries. In 1823, she found the first complete Plesiosaurus, and in 1828, the first British Petrosaur. She also found a Squalorodja fish skeleton in 1829. Despite having little formal education, she read a lot of scientific literature and even copied papers by hand to learn more. She also dissected modern animals to understand fossils better. In 1824, the scientific community expressed astonishment at Mary Anning's expertise and abilities, commending her adeptness in bone identification and the creation of meticulously precise scientific illustrations. In 1826, at 27, Mary saved enough to buy a house with a glass front shop and named it Anning's Fossil Depot. In 1844, King Frederick Augustus II of Saxony visited, purchasing an ichthyosaur skeleton for his collection. His physician noted their shop filled with remarkable fossils, including a six-foot ichthyosaurus slab priced at £15, a bargain for its quality. Over time, her confidence in her knowledge grew. In 1839, she questioned an article in the Magazine of Natural History disputing the claim that a newly discovered fossil of the prehistoric shark Hybodus represented a new genus. 
Mary asserted that she had discovered fossil sharks with both straight and hooked teeth many years prior. The magazine published an extract from her letter, marking her only scientific publication during her lifetime. This was her sole official contribution to scientific literature. In 19th century Britain, women like Mary faced exclusion from the scientific community with restrictions on voting, public office and university attendance. The Geological Society of London barred women from membership or attending meetings. Despite Mary's expertise of passing many wealthy fossil collectors she sold to, men typically took credit for scientific descriptions, leaving her resentful. Mary's companion, Anna Pinney, noted her grievances, stating that while Mary provided content for publications, she gained no benefit. Mary herself expressed feeling mistreated and suspicious of others due to this treatment. This disregard for working-class contributions extended beyond Mary, with wealthy collectors often credited for discoveries made by labourers, reflecting broader inequalities in scientific literature of the time. Mary suffered serious financial setback in 1835 when she lost most of her life savings, about £300 in a bad investment. Sources differ somewhat on what exactly went wrong. Some articles report that she invested with a con man who swindled her and disappeared with the money, but other write that it is not clear whether the man ran off with the money or whether he died, suddenly leaving Mary with no way to recover the investment. Concerned about Mary's financial situation, an old friend, William Buckland, who she had sold fossils to in the past, persuaded the British Association for the Advancement of Science and the British Government to award her an annuity known as a civil list pension in return for her many. Contributions to the science of geology, the £25 annual pension gave Mary some financial security. Mary Anning passed away from breast cancer at the age of 47 on March 9th, 1847. In her final years, her fossil work declined due to her illness, leading to rumours in Lyme about a perceived drinking problem, which stemmed from her increasing use of laudanum for pain relief. Despite this, the geological community's esteem for her was evident in 1846, when the Geological Society raised funds to support her expenses upon learning of her cancer diagnosis. Additionally, the Dorset County Museum made her an honorary member. She was laid to rest on March 15th in the churchyard of St Michael. In her memory, members of the Geological Society contributed to a stained glass window depicting the acts of mercy, honouring her contributions to geology and her compassion. However, she was never recognised as a scientist by the scientific community solely because of her gender until after her death. And you guys, did you know the remarkable story of this incredible woman? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you liked this topic because this is part of a series of videos about iconic women of history. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button so you don't miss the next episode. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.